Technologies Development at, at DCU. And we'll start off with the, the obligatory overview of the university itself. Um, I am not going to go through every one of the numbers on the, the right-hand side of this slide here, but I would draw your attention to the, um, the growth rate of the university. So from quite humble beginnings in 1980, that's about um, 200 students, up to greater than 16,000 students at the moment. And the second thing I'd highlight is the fact that DCU has actually five campuses now. The original campus uh, in Glasnevin on Collins Avenue. There's a sports campus uh, also in Glasnevin and right across the road from uh, that we have the innovation campus, DCU Alpha, uh, which acts as a, I suppose, a magnet for companies and an incubator space for our companies. We also post um, uh, incorporation of St. Patrick's College of Condra, the Matter Institute of Education and the Church of Ireland College of Education have an additional campus in uh, Drumcondra at St. Patrick's and uh, DCU has recently acquired the All Hallows campus and is uh, um, developing that at the moment. Um, so uh, the, the plan for north side domination continues. Um, but I'm going to move on from there simply to an overview of some of the infrastructural um, movements that have taken in DCU and, and uh, taken place in DCU to support the development of health technology innovation in the university. Um, we have the uh, on the top left here, the nanobioanalytical research facility. Uh, I highlight this because it's actually a shared resource. It's managed centrally by the university um, with a lot of users within the Faculty of Science and Health where there are high-end uh, characterization equipment ranging from super-resolution stead microscopes through to spectroscopy suites and also additive manufacturing facilities and polymer microfabrication facilities, all of which are accessed um, by the various professors and academics within DCU but through a centralized booking system, so it's, a, it's quite a shared resource. We also have a biotherapeutic GMP facility and this is relevant to one of the case studies I'm going to come to in a couple of uh, minutes. Um, and this has uh, level 3 biohazard containment capabilities for toxin development and uh, we'll come back to that. A number of the examples that you'll see uh, in the subsequent slides are technologies that have come out of the Biomedical Diagnostics Institute, the BDI, where I'm the Associate Director. So uh, there's a bit of a waiting towards uh, case studies of technologies coming out of the BDI and that's just my own personal bias. Um, I've mentioned DCU Alpha as an innovation campus within DCU. Um, uh, within the, the, the DCU um, organization um, and uh, this is acting as, as an incubator for a number of companies with a couple of very significant anchor clients such as Siemens and Veolia having already established um, offices and, and, and laboratory space there. You see an example of some work coming out of the NICB, the National Institute for Cellular Biotechnology, related to the area of biopharma and bioproduction optimization and all of this work in terms of how it gets moved forward into industry partnership is supported by our technology transfer office in VET DCU. Um, there are some representatives in the room here, so thanks for attending. Um, and uh, this is, uh, um, they work with us hand in hand in, in partnering with companies. Uh, I won't go through all of these entities in, in, in detail. I would suffice to say that within DCU and in particular in life sciences research, we have significant expertise and activities ongoing in diagnostics, therapeutics, medical devices, and then biotech and biopharma production. Um, in resonance with the previous talk, I'd probably like to highlight the MedEx program here, where there's a, it's effectively an exercise rehabilitation program run by the Center for Preventative Medicine, which involves the use of wearables to track patients and to track uh, adherence to uh, exercise rehabilitation prescriptions, if you like. Um, we also have a significant partnership with the RCSI and Maynooth University on the 3U partnership that focuses quite a bit on translational research in diabetes. Um, and you'll see some examples of sensor and diagnostic development coming out of the BDI and NCSR, um, and uh, indeed the NICB and, and ICNT, there's some case studies there too. So uh, with that I'll move straight into the case studies, and at the base of each of these slides you, you'll see a, a effectively a progression uh, line here where we're going from technology readiness levels one through to nine. This is a way that we rank technologies and effectively we monitor their maturation on the basis of TRLs of tech readiness levels. Um, as a guideline, TRL 3 would be that the technology has been demonstrated to proof of concept. TRL 6 in, in a diagnostic instrument case, for instance, would be that it has been developed to a fully integrated prototype and tested with clinical samples. To get the 7, we would need to have industry partnerships so that we can move into a larger scale uh, pilot um, evaluation of the technology. So what I'm showing here is an example of a lab on a disk platform. 
Uh, this is a uh, particularly strong microfluidics IP that has come out of the BDI and more specifically the group of Professor Jens Ducre in DCU. Um, there are a lot of um, spinning disk type platforms uh, in the diagnostics industry. A number of companies are commercializing diagnostic devices on this basis. What's key about this technology is the IP that we've developed in valving technology. That valving technology allows the user to make far better use of the real estate on a standard compact disc type footprint. And what that actually means is that you can put much more complex sample preparation protocols onto this integrated disc. The reason you might want to do that is to take um, a bench-based uh, sample preparation protocol that's typically carried out in a central lab and translate that into something that has the potential to be implemented in a near patient or point of care diagnostic fashion. Um, this disc for instance is used for nucleic acid extraction and purification from a whole blood sample and then integrated with uh, an amplification technology to carry out uh, detection assay at the, at the um, outer part of the disc. It has multiple different application areas um, but really where we've um, been stymied up to now with this technology is the ability to mass manufacture it. So we've been able to develop small numbers um, in order to, to produce useful publications that help to um, advance our profile. But the next stage in development of this is actually to enhance the manufacturability of the discs and to make them uh, fit for mass production. And we're soon about to announce a significant um, uh, research partnership um, that will address uh, that particular challenge, allowing us hopefully to move that right up uh, the, uh, the TRL scale. And now for something a little different, uh, we're talking about some technologies that have come from the National Institute for Cellular Biotechnology, in particular Dr. Niall Moyna, the director there. Um, this relates to the fact that within bioreactors and, and show cell based bioreactors, performance is affected deleteriously by the production of a certain microRNA, this MIR7 uh, molecule mentioned at the top, um, and it reduces cell viability and it reduces the number of viable cells as, uh, um, uh, producing the, uh, the, the therapeutic target um, or product of interest. Um, Niall and his team have developed effectively uh, for want of a better term, a sponge that mops up this microRNA from within the bioreactor media. Um, they refer to it as decoy 7. And you can see from uh, this graph on the right where the red line uh, it involves the use of decoy 7. And uh, what we're tracking here is the percentage of viable cells over time that the use of decoy 7 maintains a larger percentage of cells viable over um, a longer time. So we're getting three or four extra days of production out of this. In addition, decoy 7 increases the number of uh, viable producers, so you're getting, I suppose, um, uh, a, a, a double effect in that regard. This is cell line specific. Um, so Niall and his team have already demonstrated that it works with uh, particular uh, producer systems, and we're working with a number of companies now to confirm that decoy 7 works with their cell lines and uh, that it can then be implemented by uh, being introduced to the media. In uh, another example, I suppose, a lead on from the, the previous therapeutic application, uh, we have some very significant work ongoing um, through the International Centre for Neurotherapeutics led by Professor Oliver Dolly. And this involves uh, the development of a chronic pain treatment based on a, a patented uh, Botox formulation. Um, this has gone through, well through proof of concept in animal models and very importantly, this therapeutic will be produced on DCU campus in the GMP facility and that is quite unique from a university perspective and it's going to allow us to have that significant runway in order to move the technology right up through the TRLs into first demand trials next year um, but we will have the potential to produce um, that, uh, that therapeutic on campus. Another diagnostic application here, or probably more accurately a monitoring application, this is where we're exploiting smartphone technology to actually carry out biochemical assays. Um, the previous speaker spoke about how certain inbuilt sensors in smartphones can be used for things like physiological monitoring and looking at activities of daily living. And what we've done in this approach here is to take some of the assays that can typically be carried out in a central lab, so we were talking about uh, looking at um, specific targets within a blood volume or within a, a sample of saliva, but actually carrying out those sensitive assays um, using an off-the-shelf smartphone as a detector. 
Um, this has been achieved by bundling together a number of key pieces of IP in the area of fluidics, optical detection, and indeed the method of using a phone to actually do this. The project we refer to is, is, is MobiMate. Um, it was funded by Enterprise Ireland. Um, and we've moved it to the stage where there's a fully integrated prototype developed and a preliminary uh, clinical evaluation was carried out in patient samples uh, uh, provided by Professor Geraldine McCarthy at the Matter Hospital. She's the head of rheumatology there. Um, so hence you see that we're moving up to TRL6 in terms of uh, this particular technology. Another example of the technology at that same stage is the uh, platelet anti the antiplatelet therapy monitoring device that we have. We refer to this as the platelet monitoring biochip. This is about figuring out how well a person is actually responding to their antiplatelet therapy. Aspirin being a very well known one, Plavix and others such as uh, Cupertigrel and Pangolor being additional examples. Um, platelet function tests as they stand are not routinely used by clinicians despite the fact that a number of um, commercial devices uh, exist to measure them and uh, part of the reason for that is because of the uh, largely physiologically irrelevant means of carrying out the assay. Um, they take a blood sample, they inject snake venom into it and they shine a light through it and that's supposed to tell you about how platelets behave in the body. Um, so we've been effectively working on a platform that actually targets receptors that are particularly involved in how platelets bind to one another and form a thrombus. This is what we really want to be able to uh, investigate because antiplatelet therapies are administered in order to prevent thrombosis. Um, we've developed an integrated prototype here using a, a microfluidic platform that can assay for up to three drugs at the same time. Um, it's a, a near patient test, if you like, um, on a, an integrated prototype device that is uh, currently um, being tested in the Clinical Research Centre in Beaumont Hospital uh, <coughs> in collaboration with Professor Brown Kenny. With both this technology and the MobiMate technology, our intent is to set up a spin out company. Excuse me, is there some water? Yes. The next stage of development is um, an industry partnership that we have with Randox. <clears throat> and this involves the area of, excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. This involves the area of colorectal cancer screening, but moving away from fecal based tests to blood based tests. It's based on uh, a set of biomarkers that were discovered back in 2005, and they've moved through patenting and through clinical validation in collaboration with the, between DCU and the RCSI. And more recently we've received funding from Enterprise Ireland under the Innovation Partnership Programme to partner with Randox Chorinta in Donegal. Obviously their HQ is in Northern Ireland but they're a significant diagnostics company. And this will involve ideally translating this test onto the Randox detection platform, the Biochip Array Technology Platform, and, and then rolling it out as a, a screening tool uh, and hence the reason for its progression beyond TRL 6 to 7, where we're currently working with Randox to develop a research use only assay and move on the commercialization of this test. It's a very good example of just how long it can take to develop something right from discovery through to, um, a, even at this stage, a pre-commercial research use only prototype, where we see the biomarker discovery happening in 2005 and we're currently moving into um, early stage, uh, I suppose, clinical trials of the system at this point. Um, another example, um, and this is the final one, uh, of technology that has moved to that level, again involves the area of platelet uh, analysis, but uh, it, it's a step beyond the platelet function test that I described previously. Uh, this involves a microfluidic chip that carries out what we refer to as a dynamic platelet function test. And it allows us to pump blood through the chip at shear rates that mimic the arterial environment. The platelets are coming to contact with a pattern protein surface and effectively what we're doing is we've, we've built an in vitro mimic of an artery and we're seeing how platelets interact with that surface and how that uh, interaction can be used to infer the patient's uh, propensity to bleed or to, um, uh, to form a thrombus. Um, we've uh, exploited this technology by analysing over 400 patient samples at this point. I should mention that the, the assay itself involves actually recording movies and extracting data from those movies. So there's a lot of data analysis involved in this, which explains the involvement of ICHEC, the Irish Centre for High End Computing. 
So we've moved this technology now to the point where we've partnered with uh, Becton Dickinson, a top 10 diagnostics company, again through the Enterprise Ireland Innovation Partnership Programme, to move this assay um, out of the prototype stage that it's at with, the, with our institute and uh, translate it onto one of their diagnostic devices to really um, enhance the number of patient samples that we can analyse and the clinical, uh, and the clinical analysis is ongoing uh, with the, uh, uh, um, an end date of uh, October of this year envisaged. So that's the, uh, that's the end of the case studies that I wanted to go through. Um, I wanted to highlight that DCU is very focused on, on collaboration, in particular collaboration with industry. We have quite a number of uh, partnerships um, that will not be feasible to go through in a time like this. Um, but uh, we'd be very happy um, to, to engage with you out, uh, outside the event or, or after this talk uh, to discuss partnership opportunities. And at that, I thank you. Thank you.